the Middle Eastern Studies. And um, we're really proud to welcome Amir Talibachirovic from Sarajevo in Bosnia. And Amir has um, experienced a lot and learned a lot about the history, the wonderfully complex and um, interesting history of this country. Um, on his 19th birthday was the day the guns opened fire in Sarajevo, and he was there through the siege. And he has literally written the book on the siege of Sarajevo, because he wrote a book called The Siege of Sarajevo, um, which is available in English. It's a booklet that is for tourists. Um, Amir is a journalist. He writes in um, Bosnian for Bosnian publications. He does a lot of freelance work. He writes in English um, for other publications. And if you have any questions on that, you can ask him later. Um, also, he is a tour guide. And he has worked with, um, when Rick Steves tours, how many of you guys know Rick Steves, OK, right? Um, so when Rick Steves, Steve's tours go through the Balkans, Amir is leading uh, many of them. So I'd like to, uh, you guys, to welcome him. And remember, I'm sorry about the mic. We just, we tried. <laughs> OK. Hold on, hold on till the end. I didn't even start it yet. Well, thank you anyway. OK, so Lisa did quite a lot in introducing me, so I don't need to say much about myself except that don't bother with my surname. OK. I believe by now we don't need a microphone, right? Because I'm whispering. OK. <laughs> OK, so Pelibacirovic is my surname, but really, you don't need to bother with that. Uh, people ask me, how do you pronounce it? That's why I have a simple name, you know. My parents were practical. Uh, more easy to pronounce. So Sarajevo, Bosnia, uh, re in general region of the former Yugoslavia, as you know, or the Balkans, or parts of Southeast Europe, whatever you may call it, yeah, are so complicated that we produce more history than we can, uh, or even better to say, uh, more than we can stand. Uh, those of you who've been there, maybe you know that. Those of you uh, who try to study that history, you know what I'm, know what, what I'm talking about. Um, we can also say, I can say at least, I lived through parts of that history by living through the Bosnia without wanting, wanting to. I was hoping to live in a country like Switzerland, but, you know, they, they say, that I'm mentioning Switzerland because they say Bosnia was the Switzerland of the Balkans. And in a way it is when it comes to the mountains and sort of three languages. Only Switzerland has three languages and boring history. We have um, mountains, sort of three, three languages, but actually three dialects. And exciting history, but stuff. And too much for such a small area. Anyway, so the history, as it says on a poster that announced um, my, uh, my lecture, History of the Bosnian Muslim, Muslims uh, journalist perspective. So um, it is a complex issue, but we can put this, these things in a, in a line, in, in certain order. Talking about uh, is not easy to separate. Actually, it's almost impossible to separate the story of history of Bosnian Muslims from the other groups in Bosnia. Uh, you know, so okay, those of you who haven't been to Bosnia and reading uh, much or hearing much about that. When you talk about Bosnia and Serbs, we're talking about people in Bosnia who happen to belong to the Eastern Orthodox Church. When we talk about Bosnia and Croats, we're talking about Bosnians, people in Bosnia, who happen to belong to the Roman Catholic Church. When you talk about Bosnian Muslims, who became Muslims thanks to the Turkish Ottoman uh, occupation in the past, Technically, they are not Turkish people. They are still Bosnians. They just share the same religion and culture as the, uh, uh, well, more than they Turks, let's say, or Ottomans, uh, better to put it that way. Then we also have minorities such as Sephardic Jewish population, Roma gy gypsies, etc. But somehow these uh, three of Fantasticus, Serbs, Muslims, and Croats are the ones who are making major things in Bosnia. So we're going to go through this uh, brief, complicated, and long history. Uh, uh, what's the journalist perspective? In my case, I'm talking as an uh, insider and also as a journalist. Why journalist perspective in this case? Because you all know what happened there in the 90s. Journalists had to become historians. Historians had to become journalists. Politicians, um, well, they stayed politicians uh, over there and still today. And uh, kind of like we exchanged in all of the, so many things. Uh, medical doctors had to become 
veterinary, veterinary science, scientists, you know, professionals, you know, all of us became uh, alpinists, those of us at least who lived in, uh, in, uh, in, in under siege in Sarajevo. Uh, so it means that we had to start learning, even if you're not interested in that, we had to learn about well, why, why all these shells are falling every day around us, why there are some refugees coming down from the mountains to the city, why there are snipers you know, on the main streets, you know, like all of a sudden, after we lived uh, for more than 40 years in a relatively peaceful society of the former Yugoslavia, and uh, of course, people who are not into science, into history, into cultures, overnight they become, you know, it was kind of like almost imposed on you. So in my case, uh, and cases of my colleagues, or other journalists, we somehow, um, well, we found connection actually, you know, journalism is about sharing information and, you know, so history is the same way. And I already knew some, a lot of these things, uh, but interesting thing, in, not just in Bosnia, in the Balkans in generally, you can learn more from your grandparents than from the history books about history of the region. As it happened to me, I learned a lot, of, uh, a lot about the tradition of the Bosnian Muslims from my grandmother. But before we continue, let's clarify what does it mean? Well, who are these people, Bosnian Muslims? You know, how can we define them? Have anyone here uh, read a book, Death and the Dervish? Okay, one person. It's written by... Uh, a uh, famous Bosnian, or some people call it Bosnian-Serbian, doesn't matter, we can call him Yugoslav writer, that's what he wrote, um, Mesha Selimovic. Uh, that's, that's the book I would highly recommend, it's in English also, in, in many languages, to anyone in this room, uh, in order to gain better understanding of tonight's topic. So it is, as I said, it, it is complicated, so I'm not going to waste too much time, because I need to, I was warned, I need to watch, I need to watch the watch. <laughs> And later I will let, I'll leave some time for your questions. And as you probably know, because there are students here, there are no such a things as stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. So I'm taking the credits, you know, for bad things. Uh, Bosnian Muslims, we can call them also simply Bosnians or Bosniaks or Bosniaks. That's the current term. Now, first, let's play a little with language. Bosniak is the archaic name for everybody living in Bosnia. Um, that's the, how we pronounce it. Uh, actually, the older than that is Bos, um, Bosnianin. I guess there are people here uh, who are knows, uh, knows the Slavic languages. Uh, anyway, it turned in the Ottoman time into the Bosniak. Then at some point, it became Bosanac. So Bosanac would be somebody, anybody who lives in Bosnia, and Bosniak would refer culturally to Bosnian Muslim. But uh, not all Muslims are religious in Bosnia. So that's another confusing element, you know, who are these people, how, how can we tell Bosnian Muslims, what does it mean? Uh, we can differentiate them by names, as any other group uh, in Bosnia. They have mostly Semitic names, but even names they adapted to Bosnian tradition. You know, most of the Muslim names have some meanings either in Arabic or Persian or, or Turkish language. Uh, but they are these so-called folk names. So, for example, the most common, the most famous name in Bosnia would be Mujo, M-U-J-O. Uh, at the same time, it's a fictional character for many Bosnian jokes, but also it's a regular. It was a nickname that became an uh, um, uh, official name, not just a nickname. But Muyo doesn't mean anything except in Bosnia. So, uh, Bosnian Muslims, according, okay, since I'm a journalist, I need to use this famous or unfamous word, according to. So, uh, as Lisa said, I'm working, uh, I'm guiding uh, big tours for the Rick Steves, also the Adriatic tours. So, I'm always need to, I need to be careful, you know, when it comes to history. It's a very sensitive issue, so I'm saying according to. Even if you saw UFO, all of us, there are 30 witnesses, I would say according to me and other 29 guys, you know. So I'm always trying to involve someone else to be alone. So according to official history, uh, we need to first back, go back to the medieval period, uh, when Bosnia was kingdom as most of the other the nations. And uh, Europe, it was church that was determining way of life, either Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, or what used to be known Byzantine, uh, part of the Byzantine Empire. I'm talking about period before the Martin Luther was born, and before the Reformation, and before the Protestant Church, and mostly I'm talking about the Balkans. Then, so, all Bosnia was complicated even back then. There were three churches. There were Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and something that all historians would like to call Bosnian Church, but it's hard to say what is it actually. Uh, according to many historians, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, Boston version of the Anglican Church, let's put it this way. So even the Boston 
belong to that tradition. And uh, they are mostly known by the name Bogomils, B-O-G-U-M-I-L, or with S at the end if it's plural. Uh, those of you who study Slavic languages, you know that comes from two words, Bog, which means God in many Slavic languages, and uh, Mili, would I translate this, kind of like deer, close. Their folk name, their official name would be Christians of the Bosnian church, or simply followers of the Bosnian church. So now what's the Bosnian church, you know, generally? Um, Again, according to many historians, they differentiate from their Catholic or Orthodox neighbors uh, in certain things like places of worship. I don't know, have anyone been to Bosnia here? Okay, except the people that I know. <laughs> okay, so you've seen it's a place with a lot of mountains. Uh, so uh, Bogomils would prefer to pray rather you know, on the top of some of the mountains than uh, in the classic temples. Many people ask me, are there any Bogomil church preserved today when I guide them uh, through down there? And I tell them there is no for a simple reason. They did not construct churches. Instead of that, they had a house. It's called Hija, archaic Slavic name for the house. Still today in Slovenia, they use the word Hisha uh, for the house. And uh, places where they wanted to feel more equal in between each other, not to have a priest. They, they didn't have a, their own pope, their own patriarch or something like that. There was a grandpa, literally, did in archaic uh, Slavic languages, kind of leader of one of these particular communities. But the problem was, it seemed that Bosnia was the only country with a majority, again, according to many historic records, even the Bosnian royal family, uh, since it was monarchy, it was kingdom, belonged to that tradition. And then, as you know, in Europe, you had a problem in fitting like that with such a belief system without recognizing a pope or patriarch in Eastern Europe. Fit into any of these two groups. They felt like a Middle Ages, you know, like, and that was the, what was the punk rock today, you know, like, it's like uh, to reject, leftists to reject uh, right wings, you know, to stay in the middle. And then um, they were from time to time persecuted, either by Catholic or by the Orthodox Church, because we are talking about Europe in, um, uh, medieval Europe, you know, what was happening there. You all look younger, but you all know what, I don't, I don't expect that you would remember what happened, but we like to say, uh, just like we were, we witnessed certain things. And uh, that, that makes sense. Um, question is, how would they survive in such environments? Um, I need to make a little detour now. Uh, southern France, you know the population called the Qatar, C-A-T-H-A-R-S. Uh, many people are trying to, to link uh, Bosnia and Bogomils to Qatars in Southern France. Why? Because Qatars had similar fate. And they also rejected to recognize Pope as a major church authority. They were persecuted. According to some of the theories, without enough solid evidences, they ended up in Bosnia. Some of the groups, those who were not killed, those who were not converted, and those who managed to escape. And uh, they're using, uh, sorry, I couldn't get the big one. I had the big one, but they destroyed it in the D.C. airport. Uh, when here, because I was first in Seattle before I came here, but that's a complicated story. Uh, less complicated than our history, but it doesn't matter. So anyway, I got a small one, at least saved. You know, even the, uh, coming here from Bosnia, it was like kind of breaking through the front lines. So I have this uh, flag, I don't know if you can see, well, Lisa said that you should move further. <laughs> it's your fault, you know, why didn't you come closer? Anyway, uh, those of you who've been to France, I mean, you didn't need to be to go to the France, you know about the Fleur de Lis, the French lily flower. So this is kind of a smaller version of the Bosnian flag. Why I'm showing you this flag is because um, when Bosnia declared independence in 1992, you know, and then brutal war happened and everything else, uh, idea was to take the last flag that was in use in Bosnia when Bosnia was sort of independent, and it happened to be in the 15th century. It was this one. And they say, uh, and they look exactly like French lily flowers, exactly the same design. I don't know how well, I can leave you this later, you know, so uh, you can use it when you go to the football match, you know, just wave it to confuse the other side. You know. And uh, they, they said the lilies, flow the lee, French lilies, of course, you know, like why would they be in Bosnia unless somebody brought them from, from there, you know. And uh, that's one of the, why some historians claim that maybe, just maybe, Qatars from France brought that kind of belief system to Bosnia. Okay, th so there are no churches of Bogomils, but there are, uh, there are still physical evidences. There are some written documents, not many, but some of them are saved, and there are unique tombstones. Unique in the Balkans, I don't know if some of you have been to Armenia, you've seen the Hachkars, their famous uh, ancient tombstones with a specific en engraved, you know, like unique pictures and so on. But anyway, they still couldn't survive with their tradition. And then 
Ottoman Empire is coming in the 15th century, taking Bosnia. And as those of you from Middle Eastern studies probably know, the uh, Ottoman Empire tolerated, it was, of course, Islam was the central uh, state religion of the empire. They tolerated Christian minority as long as they were loyal, they were not rioting, and they were regular taxpayers. So in many countries they invaded before that, they found one or another dominant church. Only in Bosnia they found three. So they already had a deal with the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, they made some temporary deal with the Catholic Church, although they were not in good relations with the Western powers at that time, but Catholics in Bosnia were led by the Franciscan Church. Main bishops and uh, cardinals escaped. They left their own congregation, so people turned more to Franciscans. They were the last uh, order in Bosnia who maintained the Catholicism there. And then Bogomils, according to many historians, converted, embraced technically Islam in vast numbers for several reasons. Lower class, uh, sorry, lower class, I mean working class, let's call them proletarians of the Middle Ages. Uh, they saw a common point because it was the Sufi predominantly philosophy that came uh, with the Ottomans to Bosnia. They saw common points uh, in, the, in dogma. They decided to embrace Islam because of the treatment of Jesus. Bogomils also believed that Jesus was not crucified, like many Muslims believe, but they, uh, they believed he was, uh, yeah, they also believed he was Messiah, you know, very similar to the Muslim concept. Then uh, they, uh, they were kind of non-materialistic, similar as, as Sufis. Then what else? Oh yeah, the middle class, Bogomils, uh, or land lo landlords, uh, they wanted to keep their property. So for economic reasons, they converted too. They got new name, Semitic name, uh, not anymore Slavic, but they kept the Bosnian language and they kept the same property. Only they were not called Graf, Graf I mean, uh, as a Germanic term, or Baron, or Duke, you know, typical titles like in the West, but they got the names Bey, Pasha, Aga, typical for the Muslim aristocracy in the East. And the top uh, class of the Bogomils, well, also for political reasons, not just spiritual, they converted. And technically, that's how Bosnian Muslims became Muslims approximately five centuries ago. Although some members of the Orthodox Church, Serb Orthodox Church, and Catholic Church too converted for all kinds of reasons, not just economy. But in the end, it turned out it was a little bit about money. Turkish uh, Sultan Mehmed Fatih, second the conqueror of the time, the one who was in charge when Bosnia was conquered, he uh, didn't have interest in converting everybody to Islam also, not only because there is no compulsion in religion according to Quranic uh, but also uh, for economic reasons, if everybody would, would, would convert, he would lose certain income from the taxes minorities were paying. So the choice was, if you convert voluntarily to Islam, some taxes, but you would have to go to the army to serve the Ottoman. In the religion, uh, you're not right. You were free from serving the army, uh, but you had to pay certain taxes. So anyway, uh, Bosnian Muslims, they became kind of new elite uh, in Bosnia. Uh, for the incoming centuries, but they still maintain the Bosnian language. Recently, I discovered the oldest uh, uh, dictionary, Bosnian Turkish language dictionary, back in Sarajevo, uh, that um, that is the, the, the uh, published in the early 17th century. So when it was century and a half since Bosnia was under Ottomans, and interestingly, today many Bosnian Muslims of today are using Semitic words. For, uh, for everyday life. They say janaza, uh, which is, I think, in, uh, I'm not sure in Turkish or Arabic, janaza would be a funeral. Uh, but if it's not Muslim, they say sahrana or sporovod, which is a Slavic name uh, for the funeral. Uh, and then I saw in Turkish, uh, written by one guy from Tuzla, city in North, Northeast Bosnia, all the words were Slavic there back then. Bosnian Muslims were preserving Slavic words, Slavic languages. They were still loyal to their Slavic background, uh, even after they converted. For example, they wouldn't use the word melek, which is Arabic for angel. They would use just the old Slavic word angel, it, uh, according to this dictionary. Anyway, so not to bother you with these details. But there, was those, there were those who were in doubt, because there was a new civilization when Ottomans came there. You know, they were in Shakespearean you know, dilemma, you know, like to circumcise or not to circumcise, what to do now, you know. Because there was a completely new tradition, you know, that came there. It was, well, uh, painful a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, they had to adopt in a way, you know. So, uh, Shakespeare, sometimes we really feel like Shakespeare was born in the Balkans, uh, not only because of that. Anyway, so they somehow adopted. They found a way to become good Muslims, but also to save some of their, uh, you know, pre-Ottoman traditions, and not only through the language. 
So centuries have been, uh, centuries passed, and then we are getting slowly, uh, you know, Ottoman Empire was getting weaker and weaker, yeah, especially in the 19th century, it declined. And then Bosnian Muslims uh, had a new uh, ruler. This time it was Habsburg's monarchy. After Berlin in Congress, 1875, many uh, Bosnian Muslims turned against Turkish Sultan because they felt like uh, Bosnia to uh, Austrians, but actually it was a matter of negotiations. Uh, you all know about the Dayton Peace Accord, Dayton Peace Agreement probably, uh, that ended the war in Bosnia in 1995 in the Bill Clinton's administration time, while Berlin Congress was some sort of something similar. So anyway, it was given to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, then they came, and then after more than four centuries of the uh, Ottomans ruling the country, they're wondering, okay, now what? You know, like now instead of fez, cap, typical, or turban, they had to wear cylinders. And they had a lot of meetings, you know, like Ulema, the, um, the scholars, of the Bosnian Muslim community had a meeting, what to do now? Can we uh, accept to be ruled by the uh, Western ruler, in this case, Austrian Kaiser, Franz Josef, or shall we migrate somewhere? And what happened, uh, many of them uh, moved, they left Bosnia, they were afraid they were going to be converted to Catholic Church or, or uh, to Catholicism or who knows what. So people are spreading rumors, you know, in such a situations, you know, when, they, when you're completely losing one way of life and getting another one, I don't know if they felt like Native Americans in a way, you know, like what to do now, the way to go, that, should we stay, how is it going to be under the new ruler, you know. So, so many of them left, we don't know exact numbers, yeah, I've read so many different uh, calculations about that. Many of them left to Turkey uh, or to Macedonia, which was still under the Ottomans in that period, late 19th century. But those who stayed, yeah, yeah, Olama was divided, they were encouraging people, some people to leave. And at the same time, uh, there was those who were encouraging them to stay, because they said, if you're going to leave, especially Beis and Pashas, the elite, the Muslim aristocracy over there, they say, you're going to lose your property. It's going to be taken away from you. So, uh, and those who stayed, they rebelled. They were, they were resistant. They resisted the uh, Austrian occupation uh, when Austrians came, especially 1878. And, uh, but it was, uh, the resistance were crushed easily by the Austrian army. And, uh, yeah. Many of them uh, were hanged, public leaders of that resistance, and they still were leaving Bosnia, not so much as in the beginning, well, after when Austrians came. But then Austrians thought, like, okay, we don't want to lose these people. So Franz Josef, the Austrian king, wanted to encourage them to stay there. Uh, leaders of Serbia and Croatia at the time were hoping that Austrians will erase Bosnian elite, base, Pashas, Agas. So what happened, actually, uh, Austrians recognized them and they allow them to stay and to keep their titles. So Bosniak or Bosnian, oh yeah, I deliberately say Bosniak because that's the official name today to describe Bosnian Muslim culturally, okay, not, not necessarily through religious terms. So they stayed, they were recognized, and uh, he even granted them, you know, some new, new lands within Bosnia, and, um, but this time they had to, they, technically they just changed the direction of the taxes that they were paying. This time, instead of Istanbul, they were going to Vienna. Spiritually, uh, they made them, Austrians made them independent. Uh, they made independent Bosnian um, uh, religious leadership. So uh, they established the institute called Reis Ul Ulema. Ulema, of course, from the Arabic word for the scholars. And Reis, uh, something like, I roughly translated, the first one, anyway. So it was independent. Um, as you know, there is no institution, a religious institution in Islam. There is no something like Muslim Pope or stuff like that. But Austrians wanted to make sure they are not going to be linked to Istanbul anymore. So they said, we'll give you everything, just stay in Bosnia and be loyal to Vienna. So they established uh, yeah, they, their own uh, ulama. And that's how even today we have Bosnian um, uh, Meshihat, and, uh, which is the name of like kind of sort of council for the Bosnian Muslim scholars. But so it was kind of secular and religious at the same time. So anyway, so the life continued. Uh, Bosnia was all this time in under Ottomans in the medieval period, and now under Austrians, where it was a multicultural society. So uh, 19th century was also a period when nationalities all over Europe were being defined. So when it became clear, what is French? What does it be to be Italian? To be German? Proud Italian? Proud Spanish? And so on. Balkan populations, micro nations in the Balkans, better to say. Well, late after that. So, uh, through the influence of the Serbian Orthodox Church, 
um, vast majority of the uh, members of the Eastern Orthodox Church in Bosnia started to call themselves Serbs or Bosnian Serbs. As a reaction to that, uh, Catholics in Bosnia, also encouraged from Zagreb, from Croatia, from the West, started calling themselves Croats or Bosnian Croats. So those of you who haven't been to Bosnia, just to you know make things clear, we're talking about the same population divided by religion, but not necessarily by religion in the sense of theology, you know, just religion with a little different traditions and uh, different names. So same, ethnically same people, same population, Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Muslims, and Bosnian Croats are the same. And even minorities, the Sephardic Jews who came there, they're pretty much mixed uh, with many of the locals and so on. So Bosnian Muslims were those who stayed were in dilemma. You know, shall we wear tuxedo now? So we also wear clothing, you know, that was gone, you know, like the uh, uh, turbans are gone. And uh, some, they were still kept in some areas and villages. But there was something else, what, some harm that Austrians did to them. Overnight, they made, I don't know how many thousands of Bosnian Muslims illiterate. How come? Arabic letter, Arabic alphabet was dominant one. We still had Roman Latin alphabet and Cyrillic alphabet and Hebrew alphabet all the time, all the centuries. And Arabic was that Bosnian Muslims were using, but similar like in Iran of the C language with alphabet, so that same way with the small changes in Bosnian language, Slavic language with Arabic. Uh, right, writings, uh, it was so specific that it had its own name called Arabica, uh, referring to the uh, Bosnian uh, language with the uh, Arabic alphabet. So when the Austrians came, they kind of imposed Roman Latin alphabet as the dominant one, and they said it's obligation for everybody to learn that one. And then more conservative Bosnian Muslims didn't, were not happy for the, uh, the, their female members of their family their wives and their daughters, they wouldn't let them to go to the newly opened Western type schools. So they stayed at home. They kept learning mostly uh, traditional Arabic. And, uh, but if they would go to town from the homes, they, they couldn't buy things in the market or something. Everything was getting to be written more and more in a Latin alphabet. And that started slowly to change. There was a new generation of the Bosnian Muslim elites, guys like, I don't know if the names would mean too much to you, Safed Bek Bashagic. Uh, Musa Chazim Chatic, guys, I mean, people I would also recommend you to, if you to Google, they, they appeared in that period, end of 19th, beginning of 20th century, who were encouraging people to go to the Western schools, Western style schools, let's say. Because the Austrians still, they were okay with the religious autonomy for Bosnian Muslims, but not for political autonomy. So life continued somehow. They were slowly getting into the Western uh, fashion. So fezes were, traditional caps and turbans were replaced with the cylinders, with the uh, hats. There's one urban legend that says uh, that they were trying to encourage people to get rid of the fezes as uh, symbols of their, of their identity, let's say, uh, in just to replace them with a modern, that time modern uh, Western hats. And that's, that's the process. It couldn't go overnight. So urban, according to urban legend, one night a uh, decision was made, although uh, there was a version that says it happened later in the time of Kingdom of Yugoslavia, where the Serbian king decided to get rid of anything th that reminds people of the Ottoman past, visually. So he gave order for, to Bosnian Muslims where they get through in a Friday prayer or any other holiday in front of the major mosques in Sarajevo, Mostar, and bigger cities in Bosnia to go there with the, with the Western caps. And they didn't know what to do because he said it, everybody will be arrested who don't do that. But I think it was mostly sometimes 1920s or 30s when Bosnia was already it, it, after when the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was established. But anyway, it's interesting legend. So they didn't know what to do, and they found a, I knew we have the expression, the hole in the loaf. Uh, it, it didn't say specifically hat, just Western fashion. Because they felt when they are praying, they're prostrating down, it's easier with the fess, because it doesn't have this, you know, this part uh, as the hats have. Uh, so somebody came up with the idea, you know what, we can, we can uh, obey this order. And still, uh, we can have something on our own. So somebody brought French berets. You know, like they're easy to carry. They're Western fashion, but they're not hats. So they appeared in front of the major mosques in Mostar in Sarajevo on Friday prayer. And then the, the uh, police came on the horses and they were confused. You know, like, okay, they're not wearing fezes. They're not wearing hats, but they're not wearing, you know, wearing fezes either. So it stayed. And still today, if you go to Bosnia, you will see some very old Muslim pilgrim, not wearing fast, not wearing turban, not the white cap, but wearing uh, French, French beret. So much about colonial influences, you know, we didn't have a, we were not never occupied by the French, but yeah, like that's how the culture travels. <laughs> so Austrians are gone at the end of the World War One. 
1918, then Bosnia was joined to the kingdom of the Serbs, Slavs, and Croatians. Even the name itself of the newly formed kingdom indicates that not everybody is included, not everybody is recognized. There were no Montenegrin nationality, there was no uh, Albania, there, was no, there were no Bosniaks, there were no Macedonians, you know. So they realized it's kind of, um, it was ruled by the Serbian dynasty, Kara Djordjevic from Belgrade, and they realized it's kind of, people will complain with such a name, so at some point they changed it into the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. As most of you probably know, Yug means South Slavia, Slavic people, kind of land of the Southern Slavs. And uh, Bosnian Muslims were now oppressed in different way. Not so much to convert or something like that, but their, their elite was targeted by the uh, Serbian king. Slowly they were losing, he was canceling the, 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 in generally, the base, Pashas and Agas, they were slowly going kind of underground. And uh, so it was dramatic from that point of view. I think that was the period, 1920s, 1930s, when the elite was officially gone. It, it, technically they existed, but they were not present in a government or a society or something like that. And uh, as a religion, they were recognized. They had their own representative in Belgrade in parliament, but not as a nationality. Then World War II comes. Uh, Bosnia became, was annexed to the uh, Nazi puppet state of Croatia, called independent state of Croatia. But it was anything but independent. It was one of the German satellite states. And then there is a paradox. Heinrich Himmler comes to Bosnia. Uh, I don't know how many nights he spent there. Uh, or if he slept there at all, you know, anyway, but his elite SS troops, German troops, came there together with, um, you probably heard about Ustasha's uh, Croatian Nazi movement uh, after Bosnia was annexed, and, he, you know, Nazis were not so much into religion, they were interested in, you know, they, they had the racial programs, and they did some studies, and they sent a telegram to Berlin, Reichstag, saying that we have some Aryan Muslims in Bosnia, Muslims who don't look like Arabs, who don't look like Africans, who don't look like Turks, who look like average Central European, because maybe, I don't know, they didn't know their Slavic or Illyrian uh, origin. They didn't care anyway, they looked, you know, they could fit into the, what, what the Germans, or the, I mean Nazis, not Germans, would see as the uh, master race. Because of that, they were taken off the list of non-Aryan people, where they had, of course, Jews, um, Ustashas added also Serbs there, Roma Gypsies, uh, I don't know who else was there, some Slavic groups definitely. So Bosnian Muslims thought at that time they could be, um, they could be maybe more neutral, but it's not easy. Um, now that you're recognized as a member of the master race, so the master race, you have to serve the master race by going to the army. So they were uh, drafted into the um, uh, uh, elite Nazi, formed Nazi troops called Hanjar Division. Hanjar is a name for the Turkish knife, very specific one, and uh, guess what, in the First World War, Bosniaks were fighting on the side of the Austrians, and they designed unique uniform for them. Try to imagine typical Austrian uniform, but with fast. In the entire Austrian Empire, only, it were only, only Bosniaks had uh, this kind of uniform. Uh, there were some uh, records of the Italian soldiers in uh, Isonzo front in um, parts of Slovenia that was heavily affected by the World War I, where the Ernest Hemingway uh, fell in love with some uh, nurse, uh, although they said he was there for to fight, but nobody knows he was fighting. You know. Anyway, they say that they say that's where you get inspiration for the farewell to arms. So Bosniaks were there recognized mostly by fascists, you know. And if Italians would see them on the front, they would be easy targets with this tiny little red thing on their head. Uh, I, I, I don't know if the snipers were invented back then yet in World War One. So based on that, Heinrich Himmler wanted to uh, to encourage them to join SS troops in World War Two by promising them he will, pro he will protect them from the Bolshevism, communism, etc. And he redesigned the same uniforms, only now he added uh, on the past the SS symbol. So those who disagreed with such a policy had to run to the mountains to join to the partisans led by later Yugoslav leader Tito, although they were not sympathizers of communism, and as you know, partisans were heavily uh, inspired by the communism. But during the World War II, uh, Tito encouraged anybody to join the partisans, regardless of their ethnicity or religion, uh, they didn't even need to be members of the Communist Party uh, or sympathizers. That, uh, communism took a bigger part later, after 1945. So it's pretty much technically anti-fascist movement. They still had the Red Star as a communist symbol, but you didn't need to be a member of the Communist Party. Maybe you'll hear some anti-communist propaganda when they say everybody had to be. No, it's not true. There are many people who were religious, who were traditional, who were not fans of the communism, but they saw it as only anti-fascist force in the field from 1941 to 1945. And um, Lisa mentioned my birthday, cursed one, April 6th, 1941. 
April 6 was the year when the World War II, you know, started in Poland with the German invasion of Poland, but it expanded to the, that time Kingdom of Yugoslavia in 1941 when German airplanes bombed Belgrade, Sarajevo, and a few more cities, same date, April 6, 1941. Then Sarajevo was held by the Croatian Ustashas and Germans for four years. Then April 6, 1945, uh, Tito's partisans liberated the city. Still today, it's marked as the liberation day of Sarajevo. And then April 6, Bao came soon to that, 1992, my 19th birthday, the siege of Sarajevo in the last war. April 6 in Belgrade, 1999, because of the war in Kosovo, NATO aviation bombed Serbia and Montenegro. They studied earlier, but they bombed Yugoslav army barracks. Guess what it went? April 6. The United States is not only in the Balkans. The United States got involved in the First World War, April 6, 1917. Genocide in Rwanda started April 6, 1994. So, no, I celebrate my birthday carefully. Anyway, uh, so World War II was over. Uh, Tito was a winner. Whoever happened to be on his side, you know, is a winner. Uh, whoever happened to be members of Chetniks, they, you probably know the uh, Serbian, let's say, equivalent to Croatian Ustashas, was in trouble, uh, who was in Ustashas, and any of these collaborationist troops, you know, was either expelled or arrested by the newly formed communist police. And the uh, new country was called Federal, uh, Socialist Federal Country of Yugoslavia. Almost like a lesser European Union, made of six republics, there was one currency, Yugoslav dinar, um, and um, just so just let me check how we good with the time for your questions. Okay, um, because you know, soon we'll get to the um, to the major part uh, that yeah makes that makes the made Bosnian Muslims to become part of the CNN news. Uh, so now Bosnian Muslims were culturally recognized in newly socialist and communist society. As a country, as a republic, was recognized as one of the six republics. But Bosnian Muslims, there was no something like Bosnian nationality. Inside of Bosnia, you still had to be either Serb or Croat or, how shall I put it, uh, indecisive, something like that. That was option given to the Bosnian Muslims. They could call themselves either Serbs with a Muslim background or Croats with a Muslim background or um, sustained. It was uh, almost like in a parliament, similar to this one, yeah. Something like that. And uh, it didn't work very well like that. So then in the late 60s, especially in the early 70s, the constitution law of Yugoslavia was changed and Bosnian Muslims were, for the first time after many decades, recognized not just as a religious group, but as a nationality. It was very similar to the Eastern European Jews, you know, who could be secular, they could be atheists, they could be agnostics, but their name or their family origin, you know, would um, put them in a position to be Muslims by nationality, just like Eastern European Jews. Again, very certain similarities with that. Uh, Ser some Serbian and Croatian politicians were not happy with that, but they didn't dare to speak up because Tito was ruling these things with iron fist. And um, uh, there was one politician called Jemal Bjedic, who happened to be a uh, representative of the Bosnia Herzegovina, he happened to be actually Bosnian Muslim, uh, who was getting such a big popularity that they say he could be a second Tito once when Tito is gone. And it was so close to Tito, they said Tito loved him so much, but then he died under mysterious circumstances in 1977 when his airplane fell somewhere in central Bosnia. So anyway, uh, Tito died soon, uh, uh, in May 1980. Bosnian Muslims still kept their nationality. Uh, Bosnia as a country was recognized equally to other uh, five republics within former Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia existed for the next 10 years without Tito for the first time throughout the 80s. And then, I'm not going to bother you too much with the political background, you know, the story of Slobodan Milosevic and Franjo Tuđman and the first elections, uh, democratic elections, what they call it, in Slovenia and so on. Uh, but Bosnia was in a worse position uh, because it was, it's in the middle of the map, it's in the heart of the Balkans. And according to this pact between Franjo Tuđman and technically enemies, they had a pact about uh, div dividing Bosnia between um, Serbia and Croatia. Well, Serbia uh, that time had to go in the region that time. So Serbia was left of Yugoslavia, uh, not just Serbia itself. Idea was to divide Bosnia between Serbia and Croatia. So they expected Bosnia and Serbs and Croatia to blend in, you know, into these societies. But what to do? Not only Bosnia and Muslims, but what to do with? The thousands of people who, who were born in intermarriages. Sarajevo, Mostar, Bosnian cities, and Tuzla, and 
I can't remember which other place, had the biggest percent, percentage of, of intermarriages in ex-Yugoslavia. 20 to 25 percent of locals, you know, lived in intermarriage where the Bosnian Muslim married Serb, Serb married Croat, Croat married Muslim or Jew, you know. Uh, the, you know, coexistence were such a normal thing, you know. So when uh, my home city, Sarajevo, was under siege, as you probably know, it happened to be the longest military siege in Europe, uh, in modern days, in Europe, okay, I'm not talking outside of Europe now. Artillery siege, um, every, it wasn't war between the Serbs on one side, Muslims and Croats on the other side. It was more complicated than that. Uh, okay, I'll now limit myself only to Sarajevo. In Sarajevo, all citizens of Sar Sarajevo were victims, okay? So not just a majority Sarajevo of people are Bosniaks or Bosnian Muslims, culturally, not religiously, but uh, everybody else. There were thousands of pro-Bosnian Serbs who stayed in the city, which is why people of Sarajevo who survived the siege would rather use the term Chetniks than Serbs in order to describe those who were surrounding and besieging the city. And it's easy, it was, I don't know if you know that Sarajevo is in a very narrow valley, surrounded with hills and mountains all around, and uh, heavy artillery, it's easy to trap, to, for a city to be trapped. The same mountains that was used, uh, they were used eight years earlier for the Olympic Winter Games were now artillery positions. Literally, you couldn't go inside or outside. Now, I wanted to show you uh, a friend of mine who is a conceptual artist in Sarajevo. His name is Damir Mikšić. Uh, joking on your own account was one of the ways to uh, mental, for mental survival. You know, I was writing once an article about that. It was, uh, I think Huffington Post didn't want to publish it because it was too, how shall I put, politically incorrect or maybe sensitive, uh, because maybe you know the traditional Balkan jokes, including Bosnian jokes and anecdotes are too black, uh, which doesn't mean that people are depressive over there. It's just the reality is so black and jokes cannot be darker than that. Anyway, so that was way of mental survival. Uh, my uh, friend, as the one I mentioned, uh, Damir Nikšić, he was describing evolution and why there is a uh, misunderstanding of what happened in Bosnia and why there were some people uh, I, I, if I get one euro every time I was asked about white Muslims in Bosnia, you know, uh, today, um, I don't know, today I would be sailing on my own yacht, you know, somewhere uh, around Seattle because I like that area. Um, and uh, because it's amazingly how people still have these kind of prejudices. Try to imagine that in World War II, it was Heinrich Himmler, you know, that helped him, not him alone, but some other Nazis to uh, use that to remove them from the list of the you know, so-called lo uh, lower races. And now in modern days, in a, even in now in 21st century, people are still asking me the same questions. Oh, you don't look like Muslim. This guy doesn't look like Muslim. He has a blue eyes, you know. This one looked like a German. This one looked like a Swedish, you know, and something like that. Uh, luckily, they didn't ask people to take down their pants to make sure. Okay, okay. Well, that happened too in history. Okay. So anyway, uh, Damir Nikšić recognized this as the kind of evolution. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Uh, from, he was ironic. He said, like, we call, if somebody asks Bosnia, average Bosnian, what do you call your nationality? I'm a boogeyman, because Europe is afraid of us. By the way, Islamophobia is not born here, despite Donald Trump and everything, you know, it was born in Europe. And, uh, and uh, okay, so Bosnia happened to be in the epicenter of that. So that's him. And he made this kind of joke, so anti-anti, anti, so okay, it's like, it should be like Che Guevara, of course, with the horns as a devil representing the evil communists, and that's the evolution from, from the red into the green. Of course, reds were communists, the greens were Muslims, so the same um, kind of threat, as uh, he would say, but he was referring mostly to Bosnia. He didn't go that far, you know, like to uh, other areas, you know, like when it comes to these things. This is the... Uh, uh, one of those dark jokes is, jokes that he did. You know, six to seven, six maybe seven years ago, European Union uh, requested visa for all the passports in ex-Yugoslavia. I mean, these newly formed nations, ex uh, except Slovenia and Croatia, they never had problems in traveling across European Union. And then suddenly they dis they changed the decision. Now the people with Serbian passport, with Macedonian and Montenegrin passport, could travel, but still not people with Bosnian passport. Why it was tricky? Because Bosnian Croats could count on double, dual citizenship. If they cannot travel with a Bosnian passport, they could travel with a Croatian one. And then same was with the Serbs, Bosnian Serbs. They could have dual one. So who is left with, uh, with the one that doesn't work at all, almost at all, you know, was a Bosnian one. So anyway, that inspired Damir Nikšić to make a uh, passport. It was artwork, Boogie Land, instead of Bosnia. The nationality, Boogie Man, uh, country, Boogie Land. And this is the place for picture, for photo, you know. You know.
of course, you know, you know maybe better than me what is this refers to, you know, um, treatment of the uh, European colonial. Uh, this, is the, this is the copy of that report deliberately. Because sometimes, you know, European travelers sees, uh, they, they see, they like to see Mostar in Sarajevo as some kind of exotic places in the heart of Europe. They don't need to go to all the way to the Middle East or Africa to eat kebab. They can just fly two hours from Vienna, you know, two hours from Paris, I don't know, something like that from London to Sarajevo. They can smoke hookah over there, you know, without, without leaving Europe. And then, yeah, this is also Diamond Start work. So Karl Marx, from socialist, he turned into Muslim. So technically, he wanted to show evolution of these uh, prejudices. That was his artwork. Uh, okay, that's what this one is. So, okay, this one is more serious. You know who these, these two guys are. So they used to be, before they were arrested a few years ago, the most wanted war criminals because of the genocide in Bosnia. You all know probably about Srebrenica, you, not only Siege of Sarajevo, but many other areas where the horrible things happened from 92 to 96. And uh, so Ratko Mladic, uh, general of the Serb army in Bosnia and their political leader, Radovan Karadzic. Uh, international troops in Bosnia, according to Dayton Peace Accord, which we ironically call Dayton Disagreement, uh, signed in Dayton, Ohio, that's why it was called under Bill Clinton's administration, uh, because it's very complicated. What a surprise, yeah, like for such a country. The Dayton Peace Accord, according to that, international troops made of NATO and UN troops should stay in Bosnia, and they were supposed to, not local police, they were supposed to find these two most wanted guys and send them to tribunal in uh, Hague in, uh, in uh, Holland for trial. They were there, they are there now, but before they were hidden for years. So that, this is Damir Nekcic and he says, of course they are wanted, but there is somebody who is unwanted in Europe. So as it says here, I don't know if you can see, like, it's not about those who are wanted, but it's about those who are unwanted. Okay, this is um, passive existence. No, I, I mentioned this uh, painful aspect of uh, being Muslim or Jew, for the same matter, uh, with circumcision. Uh, the the, the uh, National Geographic had some kind of racial, um, I don't know, some racial articles in the early 20th century. There, it was still a period of eugenics, you know, like they were openly talking about that, about some, after all, I mean, there were still col uh, colonies in, in, uh, in Africa. And he deliberately, he found that article, it was from 1912, I think, when they were talking about Slavic people, uh, everybody, Muslims or non-Muslims, Slavic people, as a kind of lower race in my article in the National Geographic, and he made it like a ghetto graphic. Of course, they would like to see monkeys, you know, like eating bananas, but not the circumcised banana. Okay, this is the in that boogie, uh, boogie man passport. I don't know if you can see. So I support the idea of the solution of the Dayton Bosnia in favor of establishing the great pseudo Moorish Caliphate as the EU theme park, also known as the Boogieland Reservation. And that's how we felt when we needed visa to travel in Europe, when everybody around us could do that, we couldn't. But foreigners were coming to Bosnia, and they still do. And they're, as I said, like enjoying, it was like the theme park, you know, just like Jurassic Park, only, yeah, like for, well, different kind of species, yeah, over there. And of course, yeah, tiny little caliphate, nothing about these guys and um, new <laughs> caliph, uh, in, uh, these, what, what these guys, um, ISIS, MISIS, whatever they call themselves, and uh, even today, the, uh, the people ask me, but these guys, ISIS, you know, they call themselves new caliph, new, they establish new caliphate. Well, as far as I know, the Caligula, uh, it, it wasn't him. They, he declared his horse to be senator, right? So does it make his horse a senator? So if these guys, they can call themselves, you know, like uh, new caliph, new Muslims. Does it, does it make them Muslims? You know, these ISIS, Taliban, or whatever, there are so many of them. They, what? Oh, yeah, that's another thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, more uh, more quickly than the members of Ku Klux Klan as the Christians. So Balkan X, okay, everybody knows about Malcolm X. South Slavic supremacy, or I don't need to explain you this one. This one is more more American type of <laughs> joke, which makes sense actually in a way. It's not just a joke because you know the uh, this movement, Nation of Islam. Is, no, yes, Nation of Islam. Back in the 60s, technically they call themselves like that, but in Bosnia it already existed. Muslim by nationality. And this was the front page of the, the great pseudo Moorish Caliphate. Ah, this is the, um, okay, the Native American uh, dream catcher, but with um, a rosette that is so typical for the mosques and madrasas. 
and uh, ar arabesques, you know, like, and he just want to point out the artistic aspect of everything, just like the declaration, Shahada, um, Islamic declaration, there is no God but God, uh, God, but God and I, pref uh, I profess it, or in Arabic, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, as you probably know it, and only just put it the art. There is no art but art, so because he, was, he got a lot of criticism for his art. And that is why he wanted to remind people that what he, what's he doing, it's with a message, but it's still art. Now, you know the story of Santa Claus, of course. Uh, can he be a Muslim? Can Muslim kids? That was another dilemma that Bosnian Muslims had in, um, in socialist times of Yugoslavia. What about our kids? But Tito was very clever, and the communists were very clever when it comes to that. They didn't call him Santa Claus. They didn't call him, call him Saint Nicholas. It was, um, what would you call it? What would you call Dieter Mraz? In, uh, Papa Frost, okay, in uh, English. So that's something like we had, the generations had it in the, uh, so that way he wouldn't have a religious character, and all kids could go to him, you know, without being afraid of losing their own identity. And I don't know who took this picture where, but it's obviously that, you know, Papa Frost may be converted in the meantime. Yeah, that's, uh, of course we can, referring to a famous uh, Obama speech, uh, Damir Nekšić, Caravan of Dreams, uh, he issued a whole booklet uh, about rules, uh, how to behave as a Bosnian Muslim, and behind him, he that time he lived in, in Stockholm, in Sweden, he designed his flag, uh, he says like, Euro-Muslims can be by nationality Euro-Muslims. Like, for example, we have Democratic Christians as a political party in Germany, or uh, uh, many European nations have the cross in, the, in, the, on the, in their flag. Turkey, of course, has the red one, but he referred to the blue one and the yellow, which, which is in a Swedish flag, but also, uh, you know, Bosnian flag, you know, with the lilies, it's uh, blue and yellow, and uh, only to design crescents, but with European Union symbol. Caravan of Dreams, well, sometimes it's hard to understand this guy, but he's hilarious. Okay, we've seen the the rest of this. And uh, uh, during the siege of Sarajevo, we were also sometimes hoping because mortar shells were hitting particularly minarets in the old town of Sarajevo. And you, United Nations was selling us humanitarian food. And among the other things, there were sneakers, Nike sneakers. Why would, in the middle of the war zone, somebody send a Nike sneakers? I mean, we, we had nothing against it. Especially me, with my size of shoes, I had problems with the finding new ones. You know, if I could get from the UN, it's fine. But later, CNN and others were filming it you know, like, so there was some marketing and all of that. As I don't know who said it, that the future wars are not going to be fought, fought between nations or religions, but be, for example, it will be uh, Mike, Nike versus Google, Google versus uh, British Petroleum, uh, British Petroleum versus, I don't know, you name it, <laughs> General Motors. You know? And uh, I, I think it's already going like that, but that's another story. So um, uh, the war was over in '96 officially, but there is some emptiness left down there in the Balkans. Bosnian Muslims uh, survived the genocide, which wasn't only in Srebrenica, it happened even in Srebrenica, it was only the worst uh, massacre, but the, sometimes bigger problem starts now. Uh, two decades or more after the war in the 90s, there is still ident identity crisis, not only in Bosnia, but in the entire Balkans, which is why we as a journalist had to, as I said at the beginning, uh, to become historians in a way, you know, to deal with these things. Uh, we had to go to the quick course to recognize uh, things that were written by Noel Malcolm, Malcolm or, oh yeah, there's a good book, um, Being Muslim, a Bosnian Way, written by uh, uh, Tony Bringa, that's her name, the uh, Norwegian author. And uh, during the war, as I said, like self-irony was helping us in a way that, you know, it's simply to realize that why is the Bosnia the most unlucky country in uh, ex Yugoslavia? It's the only country with a significant Muslim population, but without oil. If we had oil, you know, maybe the war wouldn't be wouldn't last that long. So during the war, we were hoping that like, we would find some oil, we were digging trenches a little deeper, but it didn't work. And the next thing we were, we were hoping to see the girl that looks at least somehow like Monica Lewinsky, you know. So then Bill Clinton would start reaction faster, you know, like me. Uh, then then it happened. Even it was already too late for many for many people. And then we were hop hoping from, I don't know, Arab nations or somebody else to donate um, inflated mosques because many mosques were destroyed and after we build them, they were destroyed again. And then it's so like, well, what about rubber mosques, rubber minarets? You know, they can bounce back the, the grenade once it was, you know, shown. And that would be a good gift you know, as a donation instead of Nike sneakers. I mean, again, I have nothing against Nike sneakers, you know, like it's not about that. 
but that's how the life goes on. Uh, the biggest problem currently in Bosnia is not only this division, a manipulation above all political manipulation, never forget that, but unemployment. So every time you hear in the news about uh, people who couldn't live together and some, sometimes, you know, and stuff like that, uh, you could hear it. You used to hear it on CNN. I don't know who is covering Bosnia in the West now. Uh, and CNN was so much focused on negative things that we had expression. The worst curse you could hear on the siege in Sarajevo was, I wish you to see your own home on CNN. Because if you see your home on CNN, that means your home is on fire or something, you know. And uh, I mean, they were filming some positive stories too, but uh, not always. And uh, so people are divided. It's true, yeah, people are still today divided. Bosnia and Muslims, just like the area, like, like, uh, like a Belfast in Northern Ireland. You know, Catholics on one side, Protestants on the other side. We have areas with the Bosniaks on one side, Croats on the other, Serbs on one side, uh, Bosniaks or Croats on the other, and so on. But it's consequence of war. That's important for you to remember, consequence. We didn't have these things before 92. Cause, just to separate, for better understanding of either Bosnia or Balkans in general, separate terms, consequence from cause. And drop the black and white formula. And it will immediately be easier. Okay, uh, I think I broke my deadline, so it's time for you and for your questions or comments or complaints. Or, yeah, feel free to throw something. Uh, to